I've asked Josh to give us uh, an understanding of the work that he's been doing, and I know from my own experience that every time Josh gets up and talks about what he's doing, I am so much more excited than uh, before. So I'd like to invite Josh sure. to uh, take us on a tour sure, of what sure. you've been up to. Excuse me. Are you dancing? I'm going to get up oh, now. Oh, okay, good. I get the podium. Wow. I'm just saying. I'm a... <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to try to keep this exciting. So um, for, want the, some, want some water? for the past two years, I have been looking for stories about Los Angeles, the city that we all call home. Uh, and I've been looking for them in an unlikely place. Um, that ended up in this book that I just wrote um, with uh, uh, a forward by Chef Roy Choi, who you just saw in, uh, in Phil's show, uh, called To Live and Dine in L.A., trying to look at the role of menus uh, in the history of Los Angeles. And I started looking for these stories of Los Angeles uh, in the uh, vaults, in the special collection archives of the Los Angeles Public Library. They've got over 13,000 restaurant menus uh, that have been collected uh, uh, dating back to the um, uh, 1870s. Uh, and like with many cities, uh, food is a central element to the history of Los Angeles. This is the official crest of the city of Los Angeles, which you might notice uh, has olives and oranges uh, and grapes. And I know this might be sacrilegious to say, but um, L.A. used to be a capital of wine production uh, in the 19th century in downtown Los Angeles, so much so that along with olives and grapes, we had... Uh, sorry, the, along with olives and oranges, we had grapes in our city crest. So food has long been part of the identity of Los Angeles. And speaking of expos uh, and World's Fairs, at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, that is how Los Angeles represented itself to the world, as an elephant covered in almonds. That was our city. We were a food city. We were known before oranges um, as a city um, that was about the bounty of food, an excess of food, a place you wanted to move to get healthy. Uh, if you were sick, you came to L.A. for the sunshine and the oranges. Uh, uh, if you were cold, we would warm you up. We would take care of you uh, with our, our, our bountiful, Edenic food production. Uh, and this started being celebrated in Los Angeles on restaurant menus. This is from uh, the 1890s. This is a Chamber of Commerce, an official city uh, a restaurant menu dinner where every single dish was actually uh, linked toward a moment uh, of important local history. Uh, you had things like the Filet of Soul a la Redondo Beach Railway uh, or um, the Champagne to the Chamber of Commerce ice cream and cake a la Wilmington Transportation Company. Doesn't sound so appetizing, but they, they were trying to kind of sell the city uh, through food. Um, I think like many people, perhaps, um, I, when I started thinking about uh, menus, uh, about what they, they said, I really thought of menus only in two ways. Um, I would read menus as I was growing up and in my adult life to find out what was for dinner, um, but then how much would what's for dinner cost, right? These are the two main functions, I think, of a restaurant menu, of how we read it, very utilitarian. Um, and what I started to realize is that restaurant menus are, go far beyond that, that they become what I started talking about, I started thinking about as urban texts or metropolitan texts, that they actually told you stories about how cities grow. Um, they tell you about the evolution of Los Angeles, the map, the changing map of Los Angeles. Um, they also tell you about um, how um, visual elements were used to create stories and entertain us um, through visual storytelling. Here, uh, an oyster, a restaurant that began as, a, as an oyster cart on the streets of Los Angeles somehow becomes linked to the entire founding of the Western United States. Um, on the cover of the menu. Uh, a printing company called Lord Printing, Com Lord Printing Company was the only printing company in the United States that only printed menus. Um, it was all about visual design, how, how the design of menus could sell the stories um, that restaurants needed to tell. Uh, you can see there's, there's boundless examples of uh, visual design as a way of selling restaurants. Um, this is an early, one of the earliest Mexican restaurants uh, in Los Angeles where the entire menu was in the shape of a tamal. Um, this is, a, I think, a, a kind of a favorite example. My grandfather was actually a waiter at this restaurant, Ali Hammond's Steakhouse, um, which was one of the first menus to start the trend of picturing the food you were going to eat so that allegedly these, these images of your dishes would encourage you uh, to, to jump on a ham on the eggs uh, or a filet mignon or a Chicago T-bone. 
Um, one of my favorite visual uh, uh, examples in the LA menu archives are um, these really tiny miniature menus. These are very, very, very small menus um, that many of which were designed uh, to be sent as uh, postcards after you would eat. So now we're all familiar. We Instagram, we take pictures of every one of our dishes because apparently this is an innate human trait to want to share the thing we are about to eat or have just eaten to brag to our friends. We did Instagram, social media did not invent this. I'm here to report. Um, I don't know if Los Angeles invented it, but um, s kind of sharing with your friends through postcards what you just ate goes back uh, at least to the early 1900s. Um, and there's a long tradition of this in Los Angeles with these tiny souvenir menus. Um, the visual design of Chinese restaurants, we'll see a bit more in a second. Um, uh, extravagant designs meant to attract visitors, not only from local communities, um, but to get non-Chinese in Los Angeles to be attracted to this kind of romanticized um, a world of Chinese opulence and excellence in, in food. Um, again, Roy Choi, who we just saw in Phil's show, uh, I think in the, of contemporary chefs is doing some of the greatest work in how to use menus to tell stories. Um, there's a lot to say here, but I'll just focus on the fact that he uses it really as a memoir, as an autobiographical text to tell you about his roots as a Korean American uh, and how that identity shapes the choices of what ends up on the menu that you're about to eat. Uh, this is one of my uh, favorite uh, examples of what menus can tell us about as social texts, uh, issues around race and ethnicity. Um, this is from the 1940s. This was a barbecue joint in a predominantly uh, African-American neighborhood in Los Angeles that was printed on a Mexican bullfighting menu that contained, this is in the middle of World War II, uh, that contained anti-Japanese propaganda mm -hmm. Uh, on the top of the menu. Uh, every defense stamp that you buy pays the postage to send a Jap to hell. Right, so that on one single simple document like a restaurant menu, you get stories of the changing demographics of neighborhoods, the collision between cultures, uh, and um, information about how um, xenophobia and perceptions of um, so-called racial others at the time uh, showed up on restaurant menus. Um, menus, of course, also tell you a lot about cultures in exile, um, um, immigrant cultures, longings for home. This is a restaurant that my grandfather, after working as a waiter uh, for his entire life, ended up for just three years being part co-owner of a Hungarian restaurant on Fairfax Boulevard in Los Angeles. Um, uh, sorry, Fairfax Avenue. I'm going to be, uh, my L.A. citizenship papers are going to be revoked. Uh, Fairfax Avenue in Los Angeles. And this menu is, a, I think, a great example of the way that menus can be time travel for populations, to bring you back to a home that you miss. Um, menus also tell us about gender inequity and gender imbalance. Uh, in the United States in the early 1900s and the late 19th century, um, restaurants were gender segregated. Men and women could not freely eat together uh, uh, unless you were together. Uh, so women could not eat alone uh, and they had to eat behind curtains in restaurants in many cases. Um, and this started a trend of women beginning to own their own restaurants, to create their own restaurant spaces, um, particularly in tea rooms across Los Angeles, like the TikTok Tea Room. These were um, uh, restaurants that were owned by women, designed to look like Midwestern living rooms, domestic spaces that were safe uh, for women. Uh, a, another example uh, of how gender separation would happen, you'd have a tavern for the men and a grill for the ladies and the menus would reflect that difference um, between them. This is from 1915. Menus also tell us, uh, in terms of the history of Los Angeles, about the, uh, the rising uh, popularity and role of the automobile in shaping the growth of the city. Uh, we are a car city. I'm sure those of you who, who either have uh, learned a little bit about Los Angeles or visited Los Angeles know not only do we like to drive to places to eat, but we like to drive to places to eat and then eat in the cars that we drove there in. Um, this seems to be a particular LA disease. Um, chefs know to cook food that is portable, that you can eat while driving. Uh, and drive-ins were a, 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 played a key role in the growth of the city um, westward uh, out of downtown Los Angeles. And even then, you see on a drive-in, good food is good health. People were trying with these messages. Um, 
one of the more famous drives in famous drive-ins in Los Angeles history, particularly for its architecture, its mid-century architecture, was this one called the Witch Stand, which I had always heard about, but this, finding this menu turned me on to a whole other history of this restaurant. This restaurant turned out to be the site in 1951 of one of the biggest uh, racial protests in the history of Los Angeles, one of the very first sit-ins uh, by African Americans in Los Angeles to protest segregation in restaurants. Um, up until the 1940s, the vast majority of LA restaurants uh, were segregated toward African Americans. And a young black teenager in 1951, after being refused service, um, launched the biggest and most impactful protest um, about segregation in Los Angeles. So suddenly, menus, not just what to get for dinner, how much dinner cost, but become these vibrant historical texts that teach us about the long history, not just of food as community, but food uh, as inequality and segregation. Um, numerous menus that um, caricatured African Americans in Los Angeles using stereotypes of, the mam of mammy figures, of Aunt Jemima figures, of recreating, going out of their way to recreate uh, plantation era uh, images of slavery um, these were white-owned restaurants that were selling, quote-unquote, black southern food to predominantly white diners. Um, this is a menu from uh, one of the many black-owned restaurants in Los Angeles, the, the still longest-running black-owned restaurant in Los Angeles, the Golden Bird Fried Chicken Chain, which still exists. Uh, one, one of many examples of how restaurants also tell that other story, how menus tell that other story, uh, of how um, ethnic groups and minority groups uh, in cities take control over their own restaurants and tell their own stories um, and create their own worlds. Mexican food in Los Angeles. There's no such thing as Los Angeles without Mexican food. And Mexican food menus tell similar stories of the kind of the complicated nature of ethnic representation, stereotypical images of Mexicans who are either always sleeping or smoking or welcoming you in a cartoonish way um, to have a margarita and guacamole on a Friday night. Um, at the same time, Mexican -owned, many Mexican-owned restaurants um, would give you counter images of Mexican revolutionaries, Mexican freedom fighters, uh, and menus become these key texts, not just of stereotype, but of ethnic pride and ethnic ownership. I want to show you a brief clip that we did for the exhibit um, that Marty mentioned from uh, a Mexican restaurant owner in Los Angeles, a Oaxacan restaurant called Gelaguetza. Um, and she tells, she'll just, I'll show you a short clip of her talking about the importance of food in the, create, in the creation of immigrant community, community in LA. Food is everything in your life. I mean, that's like the one thing you have to do every single day is eat. People need access to this food, especially the Oaxacan food. And I always think about the kids of immigrants that aren't able to go back to Oaxaca or kids who were born here who didn't grow up with the flavors that I grew up with. For me, it's very important that generation is educated and knows about not only their food culture, but their, their, the rest of the culture that Oaxaca has for them. The history of Galaguetza starts in 1994 when my dad moves from Oaxaca to LA. He knows he needs to make money for his family back in Oaxaca. He came across a big Oaxacan community. He's like, I'm gonna open up a restaurant and I'm gonna sell Oaxacan food. How hard could this really be? In the beginning, everybody told them that he was gonna fail. Everybody was like, how are you gonna sell them these things that people never heard about? You have to sell something else. Tacos are burritos at the very least. He's like, you know what? I'm not gonna sell food to Americans. I'm only gonna sell food to Oaxacans. That idea, I'm only gonna sell food to Oaxacans, to my community, to shape the destiny and the memory of my own community, this is a, a, a common trait uh, in Los Angeles. But I also wanna point out, this is a Oaxacan restaurant serving Oaxacans in the heart of Koreatown in Los Angeles. And that's also an LA story, that layering of communities, of immigrant experiences. Um, so we've got tons of examples uh, of particularly Chinese restaurant menus in Los Angeles that tell similar stories, like the Far East Cafe, um, similar stories of non-Chinese restaurant owners who would use stereotypical images of, uh, of the Chinese people on their restaurant menus. This is from Maxi's Singapore Spa from the 1930s. Um, and I wanted to I'd like to compare that image to images of Chinese restaurant owners who said, enough with those images, we're gonna put our own images on our own restaurant menus. 
so that, again, menus become these key texts um, for the creation of ethnic pride and community. Um, but they're also um, uh, key devices for talking about many of the things that we've already heard about today, the relationship between Hollywood storytelling uh, and food and eating in restaurants. Um, and so much of the history of restaurants in Los Angeles are indeed linked um, to the growth of Hollywood as an industry. Without actors, celebrities, producers, and directors, uh, there's a lot of restaurants that would never have been able to stay open, um, like the Brown Derby, one of the more famous early Hollywood restaurants. Uh, of course, the related trend of Hollywood actors and celebrities opening their own restaurants and being very humble about their role in the restaurant putting their picture on the cover of their menu. Um, Musso and Frank's, uh, a legendary classic uh, Hollywood restaurant, uh, actually the very first uh, restaurant in Hollywood. Um, when they opened, they were, it was the first restaurant to, to move away from downtown as the center of culinary culture um, in Los Angeles. Um, and Orson Welles famously said that eating at Musso and Frank's uh, was like visiting the womb that it was a place that held that much power uh, for him. Many screenwriters, Raymond Chandler, uh, wrote uh, some of their best film work and some of their best novels sitting in Musso and Frank's uh, delicious leather booths. Legendary Hollywood haunts like the Coconut Grove uh, at the Ambassador Hotel. Uh, another legendary Hollywood haunt, uh, Chasen's, some of you might have heard about, began as a small chili cart uh, that became um, a kind of Hollywood playground, Hollywood club room, and also the site, I think, of everyone's bar mitzvah, perhaps, up, uh, up, up on this panel. Um, Judy Garland uh, was a Hollywood celebrity who, had, who played a large role in restaurant culture in Los Angeles. She was active um, during World War II with the Fred Harvey restaurant chain um, in um, bringing attention to the war effort. She also uh, helped with um, uh, her colleagues at Warner Brothers Studios to launch the Hollywood Canteen, which was a legendary Hollywood restaurant that for two years in the 1940s offered free food uh, to men and women who were serving uh, in the military service. Um, and they would be served by Hollywood actors and celebrities and agents and studio chiefs who were, who were their waiters. Um, I think thankfully not their cooks, but their waiters who would serve them at the canteen. Many menus tried to brag about this. So this was for a restaurant called King's that on the back of it would tell you that you had to eat here because Famous Hollywood actors already love the food. Look what um, Rita Hayworth has said, or Walter Winchell, uh, or Luella Parsons. They say it's good, it's gotta be good. What the world famous people are saying about us. This is one of my favorite Hollywood stories, a, a Hollywood haunt called Romanoffs, um, where just like Dean Martin, this is Mr. Romanoff himself, Mike Romanoff, total royalty, except that he was a, a pants presser from Brooklyn, a Lithuania born, who reinvented himself in the great Hollywood tradition in Los Angeles uh, as, uh, as, as, as royalty and put himself uh, on, uh, you know, with a crown and a scepter on the cover of his menus and famously would keep seats open at his restaurant um, just in case celebrities would show up. So even if they didn't have reservations, he wouldn't let other people sit there because he wanted to make sure a celebrity ha uh, had a spot. Hollywood folks had a key role in designing menus. Uh, one example among, ma among many, probably the most famous, would be Saul Bass, um, the legendary graphic artist who created um, famous posters and opening scene credits uh, for Anatomy of a Murder, Otto Preminger films, uh, for um, uh, uh, Hitchcock films, uh, and um, did a lot of incredible work within, within Hollywood, but also designed the logo for Laurie's Prime Rib up top, and uh, perhaps his, his least famous work of art, the Laurie's Doggy Bag. Um, so from the Hollywood studios to the food that you take home, I guess to your pets, which is another maybe American thing. Um, uh, and then this brings us uh, closer to the present day, uh, the opening of a restaurant called Ma Maison, uh, that became um, another legendary Hollywood restaurant, uh, in part funded by the great Gene Kelly. Uh, there's Wolfgang Puck. Um, uh, there on your left, uh, who Sherry worked with uh, for many, many years. Um, and uh, Ma Maison became another kind of extension of Hollywood um, that not only invited celebrities uh, to help fund, but also, of course, uh, eat at the restaurant, but celebrity artists like David Hockney uh, to actually um, paint the menus themselves. This is a David Hockney original that was painted for the restaurant. Uh, and this is one of many original artist works that um, uh, were created for this restaurant. And Wolfgang Puck's experience at Ma Maison helped, I think, shape 
um, his relationship not only to incredible food, um, but his knack for nurturing conversations with Hollywood and Hollywood communities. We saw those great photos earlier of, of, of Oscar statuettes surrounded by food, so legendary post-Oscar parties uh, at Spago. Um, and this is a long history that these menus tell um, uh, uh, a number of different stories about. And so when we did design this exhibit, uh, which is currently at the Central Library in downtown Los Angeles, we tried to channel that relationship between um, Hollywood storytelling, Hollywood spectacle, but also those important stories about community and politics that I mentioned earlier, and we created this exhibit um, which invites people to sit down and be a part of these living stories. But it's an exhibit where um, there's a, a, a saying that you see in a lot of LA restaurants, sorry, in a lot of restaurants across the United States, um, where it says, we reserve the right to refuse service to anyone. So if you just, a restaurant decides that they don't want to serve you because of how you're dressed, they have the right to do it. So we say, we're going to turn that around, that we're going to re reserve the right to refuse service to no one that this is a vision for the kind of food culture that we're talking about here at World Expo, that food belongs to everyone, um, that restaurants have the power to be models of democracy, um, and that we should all be allowed a seat at the welcome table, and that the stories we tell about food should not just be determined by chefs, should not just be determined um, by those in the food industry, but determined by all of us. So in the exhibit, visitors have a chance to write their own menus that describe their Los Angeles, to tell their own stories about their own city. Um, but in the great Hollywood tradition, just to end, I want to tell you that we turned um, all of these menus, all of these archives, into a show. This wouldn't be an L.A. story without a good show. Uh, and we just recently had this big night at a historic old uh, Hollywood theater um, in downtown Los Angeles uh, where we took these menus and brought them to life on stage. Uh, and we had a DJ on stage there on the left at the same time that Roy Choi was on stage with his team cooking. So all night long, for almost three hours, you had a DJ cutting up music, and you had Roy and his cooks cutting up and preparing food. Um, we had special guests, like this guy you might recognize here, Norman Lear, talking about his work with Evan Kleiman, a very important food journalist um, and radio reporter in Los Angeles. Um, but it ended, and I want to show you a clip of how the night ended, with a guy named Supernatural. Supernatural is the most legendary hip-hop uh, MC, most legendary rapper in the world, who is known for freestyling, which is the hip-hop version of jazz improvisation. Supernatural never works from a script. He doesn't write out what he's going to rap. Uh, he waits to be inspired by his audience, and he creates on the spot. So we figured, how fitting, if Roy Choi, cooking all night long, would at the end of the night give Supernatural some food ingredients and give him some finished dishes, and what would this rapper do with that food? You want to come with me? Yeah, I'm going to give you one of those. Yeah! Let's go. Listen. Supernatural achieved that night, I think, was a testament to the power of food, the testament of restaurants, the testament 
of restaurant menus and a testament to all the work that's been done here around food at World Expo, which is that food is about communion. And I wanted to end today uh, with a quote from the great Los Angeles uh, food writer uh, who, who decided to become a food writer while reading recipe books um, in the archives of uh, the Central Library in downtown Los Angeles, um, the great MFK Fisher, who said that there is communion of more than our bodies when bread is broken and wine drunk. Thank you very much. Thank you.